member of our Division of uh, Trauma Surgical Critical Care Burns and Acute Care Surgery, and that is Dr. Allison Burnson. Allison uh, came to us from uh, UC Davis and originally uh, uh, from Colorado. And uh, Allison is a very busy uh, general and acute care surgeon, but she has a special interest in, uh, in the developing world and bringing basic surgical care uh, and trauma care to uh, the rest of the world, particularly disadvantaged world. And it's become obvious that uh, one of the greatest disparities in health internationally, particularly in the third world, is uh, lack of access to even basic trauma care and basic surgical care. And so the global surgery and global trauma issues are, are uh, being with Allison. So I know you're going to enjoy your talk. Um, here she is, Allison. Dr. Dr. Burns. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. I um, hope everybody's having a good afternoon and you know, up and awake after the bleeding control thing. Got to play with the tourniquets and whatnot, which is always fun. Um, so as Dr. Doucette said, I'm Allison Burnson. I'm one of the assistant professors in the Division of Trauma here. Um, and I was asked to talk about global surgery and trauma. This is not all just cool pictures from things that I've seen or places that I've been overseas. So sorry if, if you were hoping to just see really cool pictures of like tropical diseases and whatnot. There are a couple pictures at the end, although I left out the gross worm pictures. Um, but we're gonna talk a little bit more about kind of why global surgery and trauma is a problem and kind of how the paradigm is really shifting to help deal with this. Um, so why global surgery? Why are we at a trauma conference talking about global surgery when we're supposed to be talking about how to take care of trauma patients? And it's really because there's a massive need, as Dr. Doucette said, um, for surgery abroad, and there's huge healthcare disparities. There, there are differences between high-income countries and low- and middle-income countries, and the differences between surgical care and medical care abroad are vast. Um, there's huge disparities, and that's something we really need to address. Um, so in terms of need, there's a huge deficit in the number of um, surgical cases that are needed abroad and how many are provided. So about five billion out of the seven billion people on the planet lack access to safe, affordable surgical care. There's a smaller number that lack any access, but five billion people can't get access to safe and affordable anesthesia or surgical care. They estimate that every year in the developing world, they need about 143 additional surgeries just to prevent death and disability. So we're not talking about elective procedures or cosmetic procedures, but just to keep people from dying or being disabled, they need another 143 million procedures. And the world could really benefit from another 2 million surgeons, anesthetists, and obstetricians. So this is a huge gap and not something that we can provide by just going over and, and doing care in third world countries. This is something that really needs a whole systems development perspective. And these numbers are all from the, the Lancet Commission on Global Surgery, which came out a couple years ago. In terms of disparities, if you look at the poorest third of people in the world, they only get 6% of all of the surgery in the world. So a vast majority of surgery is done in high income countries. If you look at common GI diseases, so appendicitis, biliary disease, inguinal hernias, and abdominal hernias, 65% of the disease burden worldwide could be alleviated if people had access to first world levels of surgical care, more than half of it. This could save five million disability adjusted life years annually, so years of productive life that people lose due to not being able to work because of these diseases. And the financial impact is much greater on people in um, low and middle income settings. So. If you look at the lower middle income countries, up to 20% of people will have a financial catastrophe if they seek surgical care, whereas in the US that's less than 1% to 2% and that's only in the poorest strata of people in high income countries. So it's harder for people to get care when they need it, they have trouble seeking it, and then they also end up with financial catastrophe if they do seek it out, so it's a huge problem. Switching to more disparities just in trauma, this is actually even more dramatic. So the Lancet, when they went and looked at, uh, or in the World Health Organization, when they look at total burden of disease of all medical and surgical disease from the entire world, 10% of the global burden of disease is due to trauma, injuries, things like broken legs, broken arms, hernias, 
um, you know, problems after cesarean sections, 10% of all the disease in the world is due to trauma. So it's a huge problem. And it's the leading cause of death for people under the age of 40 and above the age of five. Um, there are estimated almost a billion injuries that require healthcare every year. And 21% of this burden would be alleviated with really basic surgical care. So basic fracture management, the ability to do a laparotomy or a C-section would alleviate a huge burden of this, a huge percentage of this disease burden. Um, most of it is road traffic accidents, but a lot of other things play into this. It's not all cars, it's not all war, a lot of it's falls and you know, other things that we deal with here. Um, it really makes a difference in terms of what country you're from. This is not, this is a worldwide problem, but it mostly affects the low and middle income areas. So even if you look at Europe, 45 deaths per 100,000 in high income countries, 126 in low and middle income countries just within Europe. So it's only partly where you are, it's mostly a matter of the socioeconomic state of your country. Um, so are we, are we making any progress? Are we doing any better at this? So this is looking at disability adjusted life year rates, so how many years of productive life people are losing due to disability, and comparing 1990 to 2013. So all of the countries that are green, purple, blue are all doing better. They've made progress since 1990. But a couple countries, the yellow, so parts of Oceania, parts of South Africa, are doing worse over those 23 years. Um, and this is for all injury together. So the disparity gets worse and worse as the high income countries do better and the worst off countries do worse, the disparity gets even more productive. And that's for all injury. What if we look at road traffic accidents? Because a lot of the improvement in all injuries is actually due to improvement in burns. So if we look at just road traffic accidents, the disparity is even worse. So South Africa has taken a huge setback in how people do after road traffic accidents. All of Western and Central Africa is doing worse. India is doing worse. And a lot of this is because people have access to more cars. There's more cars on the road, so more people are getting hurt, and it's overwhelming an already stretched thin system. So this is getting to be a bigger and bigger disparity as time goes on. So what, when we talk about this in trauma, we really refer to this as the neglected ec epidemic of trauma care, because it's not really getting the attention that a lot of other things are getting. Um, so if we look at the top 10 leading causes of death worldwide, this is again is from the World Health Organization, all of the trauma things are moving up as we do better and better at treating the other diseases. So mostly infectious diseases we've gotten a lot better at treating. So as those drop down, trauma becomes a bigger and bigger percentage of what's injuring and what's killing people. And it's not just the fatal injuries, right? The fatal injuries are the tip of the iceberg. So for everybody who dies who's one of these statistics, there's more people that are injured and in the hospital, more people that are injured in the emergency room, injured and getting primary care, or injured and not getting any care. So when we just talk about fatalities, we're really not talking about the whole picture. To kind of put it in, uh, in reference to some other things that we hear a lot about, so have six, me six million people dying every year as a result of injuries. 10% of the world's deaths, and this is 32% more than the number of fatalities if you put TB, HIV, AIDS, and malaria together. So trauma is killing more people than all these other things combined, but you don't hear as much about it out of the third world as you do about all these other infectious diseases. Um, I know this one's hard to read, I'm sorry, I couldn't find a way to make it smaller, but this is comparing how many people die of a disease to how much funding the disease gets at the top, things like HIV, AIDS, and cancer get way more funding proportionally than the burden of disease. So a lot of people are, are suffering from it, but they get an out, or an out um, they get much more support for funding for research than the number of people that suffer. At the very, very, very bottom, completely on the other side, is injuries. So we get a fraction of the funding, even though it's hurting more people. So we're kind of the neglected epidemic. So what do we do about this? We need to do something about this to try and alleviate this burden, and there's a lot of potential things that we can do. There's a lot of different ways that you can help with surgical care or trauma care in the developing world, and it really runs the gamut. So things from fundraising, you know, donating to um, you know, UNICEF or donating to you know, Oxfam or these other groups that are doing stuff abroad, actually going and doing disaster relief, you can go work for Doctors Without Borders, you, know, you can donate money to them or go work for them. Short-term surgical missions, very, very popular long-term missions, people that go and live in places for years and work there. 
you can do policy stuff, you get a master's in public health, work for political science, do policy, work for the World Health Organization, help develop infrastructure and systems, help do education in third world settings, help do research in third world settings. And there's a huge variety of things you can do. So this, this was actually myself and a friend of mine operating in Haiti when I was a resident. Um, but whatever you do, it has to be sustainable. We're just going over and doing something that helps short term, helps but isn't really the long term kind of solutions that we want. And the benefits really have to flow both ways. And so this is something that's getting a lot of attention outside of healthcare. A lot of other types of aid and volunteerism, volunteerism things that people do, we're realizing maybe we're getting more of the benefit than those people are. And so that applies to healthcare too, is you have to make sure that it's helping the country that you're going to and not just helping you feel better that you did something to help out. And this really, in healthcare and in trauma care, is really in a shifting paradigm. This is changing a lot over the last 5, 10, 15 years, and people's opinions about this are really changing. Because historically, in medical care, most um, aid has been fundraising, so donating to groups that do work abroad, like the Red Cross, and people actually going and doing direct patient care, whether that's short-term, long-term disaster relief, has been where the majority of our aid historically has been. And these trips do fill a need. There are uh, absolutely, after the earthquake in Haiti, people needed to go over there and provide care, otherwise people wouldn't have gotten any care. You know, war zones, the stuff that MSF does is a need. Um, and there's not many other options in that acute situation. But we have to think beyond that. We have to think about the long run and what we're gonna do to help alleviate this problem as time goes on. And this is kind of increasingly a concern and something that people are paying more and more attention to. Um, the picture is one of the hospitals in Port-au-Prince that actually collapsed during the earthquake. Obviously those patients had nowhere else to go. They needed people to help come and take care of them. But we also have to build up the system to keep, help keep this from happening again. So some of the concerns that have been raised about short-term trips, and again, these do fill a need. I'm not saying that short-term trips don't have any role, but there are concerns about how they fit into the big picture and why they shouldn't be the only thing that we do. Um, you need to make sure that those patients have follow-up afterwards, especially if we're talking about surgery. What if they have a complication and the, and the group is gone? Who's gonna take care of them? Um, there are a lot of concerns about people working outside of their scope of practice or above their training level. Um, so I was a chief resident, I was working in Haiti, I was doing surgery, but I was with a trauma surgeon, I did all of my cases with her, she was a US trained surgeon at an academic center. Um, and sometimes people go over there and they get thrown in and they just do stuff that they would never do at home and that may or may not be appropriate. And sometimes you can actually make the long term situation worse. So this is something that's really kind of coming to the forefront and you're even seeing it in the lay press now about the situation, particularly in Haiti. Um, is us going over and doing cases can interfere with their long-term development. So if you're going over and providing cases for free and they're t coming out of the public hospital where the residents are, now the residents are doing fewer cases, that's not good for their long-term development and this happens. It can promote reliance on foreign aid. The government of Haiti has come out and said, why should we spend more than 2% of our gross domestic product on healthcare when all the NGOs come and do it for free? Um, and it takes business from the private sector. So there are private sector doctors there that can't find jobs or that don't have any patients coming to their private clinic and they've had to shut down because they can't pay the rent on their building. There's pharmacists who have nobody to buy their money or nobody to come and buy their drugs because everybody gets drugs for free from the NGOs. And it really bypasses the public system in terms of long-term long development. So locals get left out of the planning process. They're not part of the future goals of the system. And you can even work at cross purposes. If I go into somewhere, I don't understand what their needs really are because I don't live there, I'm not from there, and I start doing something different, it can actually go completely counter to what they're trying to do on their own. And nobody's trying to do these things. Everybody has the best of intentions, but this is something that we're starting to realize a little bit more and more that these things are happening and we need to be aware of them. So this was actually, just came out uh, two months ago, less, six weeks ago, in the Washington Post, and this is written by the president of Haiti. Um, and it's only a little bit about healthcare, but it applies. Where he said, the general paradigm of aid and power in Haiti, as elsewhere in the developing world, is not a balanced one. Our government is often sidestepped by aid agencies that refuse oversight as they pursue their own development and humanitarian agendas in our country. The level and direction of aid and its implementation is controlled by donor forces with little or no input from Haiti's government or other local stakeholders. And again, nobody's meaning to do this, but 
the people there are kind of saying, hey, we need to be a voice in this too. We need to take charge of this and take ownership. And that's where he goes with the rest of this editorial is he's like, this is our country. We need to be in charge of this. We want your help. We need your help. But we need to be a part of it and not just people going around us and doing their own thing. Um, so what we're seeing more and more, particularly in academics, is more of long-term partnerships that are coming up. And so far, this is mostly academic centers in the US or maybe other big healthcare systems, finding a single global site and partnering with them and making a long-term relationship with that single site that then may expand out to surrounding sites. Um, and there are other ways to do this. You don't have to be in an academic center. It's easier because you have more resources than a single person. But really getting that kind of long-term collaborative relationship is definitely the change that we're seeing in the global surgery world. This lets us do education, it lets us do research, especially if we're in academics, it lets us do work on systems development. Um, a lot of these groups that are a partnership between two centers will have bilateral site visits, so it's not just that I go over there, but you can come over here, you can see the way that we do things, we can teach you different skills, have your residents come over and we'll learn from us. And it often involves some patient care, as if I'm going over there to teach surgery residents, I can do surgery with them to help teach them and maybe offload some of the burden of teaching from their very shorthanded attending staff. Um, but it's beyond just patient care. We're looking at kind of the bigger picture. Um, it's to the point where people are printing whole books about academic global surgery. So this is actually an article that I really like that came out in the British Medical Journal within the last year or two. Um, and it's actually a roadmap for global surgery. They're talking about goals for 2030, and they put this out as a roadmap for high-income countries. What should we be doing over there? And they break it down into recommendations for the school or the training programs, like the university, versus actually for the academic surgeons. And they're really focusing on these same education, research systems, development, things that we're talking about. So for our centers, they're saying you should have your center be in full partnership with the institution in the low and middle income country. Um, people here that are interested in this should be able to have a career in global surgery. That should be able to be our academic focus so that we can, fo we can go over and do this work and get credit for it towards our academic goals. We need to provide opportunities for trainees in lower and middle income countries to learn, to conduct research, to present research, to give them the same opportunities our own residents have. For academic surgeons in high income countries, we need to set up sustainable research partnerships where we make sure we don't go over and steal all the interesting data and present it. We have to give them the opportunity to present their own work in their own setting. We need to teach people research methodology. We need to set up quality improvement programs to help them do the best they have with the limited resources that they have. Um, long term relationships so we can help figure out what the priorities are over there and really take our cues from them and then evaluate solutions to care delivery problems rather than just describing the problem. So don't go over and just provide care. Don't go over and just say, well, only three hospitals have chest tubes. Go over and say, okay, what am I gonna do about the fact that only three hospitals have chest tubes? What are we gonna do about that? So kind of the next step. And this is just like everything else in healthcare and research is you build upon yourself. You start out in one place, then you go on to the next step and the next step and the next step, and we're always reinventing what we're doing. So this is taken off. If you go on the internet and you Google, you know, global health, global surgery, there are like logos and groups. The list on the right is something that um, we were starting to try and put together a little global surgery thing within our department of surgery. And this was a tentative list that one of our members came up with of universities in the US that have global surgery programs. It's huge, like this is taking off. Um, so it's definitely becoming kind of the current paradigm. It's not necessarily the ideal, it's not the end all be all, but it's the next step in the evolution of this care. So we're gonna talk a little bit about kind of these thing, these big three things, the education, the research, the systems development, why we care about these. So the good thing about surgical education is it's actually pretty easy to provide, right? I teach here all the time, I can go teach somewhere else. It's sustainable, I teach somebody, they teach somebody else. It's scalable. I teach five people, they can each go out and teach five people. Now we have 25. They each go out and teach another five people. You can get a lot of value. So sending somebody over to teach is much, much cheaper than sending over a bunch of supplies or a bunch of fancy new radiation oncology equipment. This, you get a lot of quality, a lot of bang for your buck, um, a good return on your investment. It really leads to some nice ongoing partnerships. And it really crosses over with a lot of other types of aid. You can operate and teach at the same time. You can provide care in a clinic and teach at the same time. It's something that's easy to add. 
Education also ties in very well with research. So this is a group just up the road um, from where I work in Ghana. They're at one of the other medical centers. And they went through in 2004 and did an assessment of trauma capacity. And then they went through again 10 years later and did a reassessment. And they looked at things that changed and what the problems were. Why were there still limitations? The biggest reason when they were looking at why some piece of equipment wasn't available that people needed, the biggest reason was they just didn't have the piece of equipment. But the second biggest reason was that they had the equipment and nobody knew how to use it. And that's a lot easier for me to fix, right? It's hard for me to make sure that you always have chest tubes available. But if you have chest tubes and nobody knows how to use it, I can go over and teach people how to use it a lot easier than I can set you up with a long-term pipeline of chest tubes. So this is something that I thought was really interesting and very actionable. Trauma research can then lead into trauma systems development. So this is, again, from the WHO and something they use here and in other countries is it starts with surveillance, knowing what's going on in the community. Once you know what's going on in the community, you can identify risk factors, you can come up with a plan to intervene, and then you can put that in place and then go back and look and see if you actually made a difference. And this is how you lead to policy changes and systems development within an area by starting with research. And as we all know from the example here in San Diego, systems development saves lives. So this is before and after the development of the San Diego trauma system in the 1980s. So the year before the trauma system started, we had a 26% patient mortality rate. The year after the system started, by doing nothing but putting in a system, we had an 8% mortality rate. So we dropped it in a third just by having a trauma system and saying, these patients go to these hospitals. Didn't do anything else, just got organized. So you can do the same thing in other places and it's not as research or, lab or not as labor intensive as a lot of other interventions. So this is why we need global surgery. There's a need, there's huge disparities, and we can't fix all of these problems alone. Even if everybody in the US and the UK and all of the developed world went over and said, okay, I'm gonna go help and I'm gonna do surgery cases, we can't make a dent in what they need. We have to help them fix this problem on their own is the only way we're gonna get ahead of them. So I am gonna talk a little bit about what we're doing because if people do wanna see interesting pictures, I hope. Um, and just to kind of put into context that this is what we're doing and this is what we're working on. And we're working on a couple different fronts. So this is a picture um, from the beach in Cape Coast right next to the big castle that's there. That's the big main tourist attraction. Um, so I work at the University of Cape Coast in Ghana. I go over about once a year and I teach and I do research. Um, I've been going since 2015. This was my first group of students that I took through a training course and they had to get up at the conference and do a little demo of a trauma resuscitation and they did a great job. Um, and we're doing all those things that we're talking about. We're doing education, we're doing research, and we're trying to do systems development, although that's a bigger hurdle. Um, so our goals when we started out, we've achieved a couple of them, is we taught the first team course, which is the Trauma Evaluation and Management course. It's put together by the American College of Surgeons. It's aimed at medical students or at countries that don't have the resources to put on a full advanced trauma life support course. This is like the first half hour of a trauma resuscitation. Um, so we did the first, this course was taught for the first time in Sub-Saharan Africa at the University of Cape Coast in Ghana. And we've taken an expanded version of this, so the team course plus some hands-on modules like a chest tube dummy and an airway dummy, and we've turned it into the basis of their trauma curriculum for their med students. Um, we we'll have an ongoing needs assessment for the area. I go over and I talk at their trauma conference every year that brings in a bunch of people from the area and try and do some education that way. And then we have some specific research and education objectives that are going forward. Um, so our new goals, we're kind of expanding on that. We're evaluating what we've done in terms of making progress with teaching this team course. So this is a snapshot from something we're hopefully presenting at the World Trauma Congress this year. Um, the blue, the low and middle income country is the University of Cape Coast. The orange high and middle high income country is the UC San Diego med students. Um, and our students start out with a higher level of knowledge than the Cape Coast students. And even after the course, they have a little bit higher level of knowledge. But six months later, the Cape Coast students know more about trauma than our students do because they use it every day. Our students go off and they do radiology and pediatrics and other things, but the Cape Coast students actually use this. And so they're, they continue to have that knowledge that sticks with them. We're working on expanding team to the other med schools in the country. There's four other med schools. I've been talking to people up in Tamale about maybe taking the course there. And then I'm working with the residents. So this last time I spent basically a whole week as like visiting faculty with the residents, just going through all of abdominal trauma, whatever they wanted to talk about. 
Um, we're also trying to do research. This is much slower because they don't have people to do this. They're too busy. Um, but we're working on it. We found some undergrads who are interested in helping out. And again, this is kind of some very, very, very preliminary data looking at not causes of death, but people who had an autopsy because they have a pathologist there who does a lot of autopsies. So it's related to all deaths, but not the same. We know that most people in third world countries that have a trauma have an injury in a road traffic accident. What we didn't expect was that the second biggest group was drownings. So nobody knew that. It surprised everybody there. And this helps influence policy and it helps influence where the government can put their money, right? So nobody knew that all these people were drowning. They're right on the coast. Maybe we need to do some kind of prevention effort about that. I don't know what, that's the problem, but it refocuses our efforts because something we didn't expect came up and we never would have done this if we hadn't done the research. So I know the others are small and hard to read, I'm sorry, but those are the two big ones. So that's what we're doing in Ghana. Um, through the people in Ghana, I was fortunate to meet a couple of uh, Nigerian expats who work in the UK who wanted to go back and do some stuff in Nigeria. So started working there the next year. This is the National Trauma Center in Abuja um, that has a pretty big presence. It's a pretty nice hospital for the area. Um, and we went over and we helped start a trauma conference there the next year in 2016. And we've had it two years in a row now. We have it coming up again this year. This was the flyer for the second um, annual trauma conference. And this is a multi-specialty conference, so a little bit like this, where we have physicians, residents, nurses, their equivalent of EMTs, road safety people, um, and cover kind of everything. We do three days and do lectures, um, workshops, all kinds of stuff. We get feedback every year on how to, how to improve it. People seem to like it. And then we have some sub, uh, sub goals within the conference of trying to connect the stakeholders from the area so we can work on setting up a trauma system and just raising awareness in the community. Again, that people don't necessarily realize how big of a deal trauma is when everybody's focused on infectious disease and everything else. Um, if anybody's wondering about the course fees, it's about $40 for the doctors and um, half that for the nurses, so not too expensive. Um, so like I said, at the conference, we do lectures, we do hands-on workshops. I taught a bunch of the nurses there some basic ultrasound stuff. We do panel discussions, bringing in all these various stakeholders. And this was from, I think, our first year when things we can improve, the most common thing people said was do this more often. I want more frequent training. Like they found it useful, I think, and they wanted to do this more often. The second biggest complaint was the food, but that's the same everywhere. <laughs> um, so in terms of trying to connect stakeholders, we were able to go and meet with the Federal Road Safety Corps. This was a shot from their website after we were there, um, who actually have a really impressive EMT pre-hospital system that only does road safety. So they have these great medics, they have the best medics in the entire country, and all they do is road traffic. So they'll come get you if you're in an accident, but they won't come get you if you had a heart attack because that's not road safety. So we're trying to convince them that they need to expand and do other stuff because they're so good, and we're not there yet, but we're trying. <laughs> um, um, and then we did some trauma awareness. The little news crew came out and talked to us, which was fun, um, and got to kind of explain to people why this is a big deal. So it was myself and then David Allow, who's one of their, um, he's a Nigerian-born emergency room doctor who now works in the UK and tries to go back and do this kind of work. So future, our conference this year, November 26th, 29th. Anyone wants to go to Abuja, get some CME? Uh, it's a long way to go. <laughs> um, we're trying to really increase the role of the pre-hospital personnel. So the first year we had everybody lumped together. The second year we split out into different, we had some things together. We had one, and then we had one track for the nurses, one track for the doctors. We're trying to kind of expand the role of the pre-hospital guys, seeing if we can give people a certificate that they can, that would be of use to them, that they took this training. Add in some research components. So they do have trauma fellows at um, the teaching hospital there. We're trying to, they're doing some research. So we're trying to get them to present some of what they're doing. Um, trying to train everybody in BLS because almost no one of the nurses there have ever actually taken basic life support and aren't certified. Um, and then trying to get the residents and fellows to help as instructors so that this can become more self-sustaining in the long run. We're trying to set up a trauma council of everybody at the other hospitals in the area to kind of have like a little trauma committee for the area like we do here for the county. And then trying to get grant funding to help support some of that. Um, and then finally, this is all Africa. We're 20 minutes from Mexico. Why go all the way to Africa when I've got a place that has a big disparity in terms of healthcare right across the border? 
So this is something I, I got very lucky in that I was kind of invited to join this group. I take no credit for this. Um, but we're trying to rekindle some trauma relations with the group in Mexico. Um, this is really being led by the Office of Health and Human Services and the actually uh, the EMS um, division here. So Christy Koenig um, through EMS is one of the big proponents of this because we have such a unique geographic opportunity, right? We get patients from Mexico every day that are in our emergency department, in our trauma center, and we have patients that go back and forth. They get their surgery here, they get their follow-up in Mexico, vice versa, so it's really something we can intervene on. Um, I'm a part of the education and training task force trying to work on this. They have multiple other task forces. Um, so we did our first educational seminar in March where we actually went down to Tijuana um, and did a bunch of panel discussions with some of the trauma surgeons there from the, um, their version of the Red Cross, Cruz Roja, some of the other big hospitals in the area um, where they did some trauma lectures. We did some trauma lectures. We talked about issues with cross-border transfers, what we can do to help alleviate that. And then long-term goals, again, we're trying to make this sustainable, have more of the, tra of the Tijuana physicians have a role in it, try to improve transfer communication because we get all these transfers that we get no pre-warning or no information about. Um, try and do some more educational exchange, maybe even some mini fellowships where our fellows here who don't see a lot of penetrating trauma could go down to Tijuana and see all the gunshot wounds they ever want to see. And some of their trainees could come up and see some of more what goes on in our system so they can see what they can maybe adapt down to Tijuana. And then work on kind of a collaborative quality improvement process related to the transfers. Um, so that's what I have about global health. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, but this is really the best part of these long-term partnerships. This is my friend Martin at the University of Cape Coast. I've known him now for three years. We text and we send each other pictures of cool cases and he's my friend. And this is really the best part that comes out of these long-term partnerships is you get to work with the same people every year. So thank you. Questions for Allison?